Well, it's time now to introduce Dr. Alan Hershkovitz, who is Senior Scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Alan uh, has been changing the game uh, for sustainable business development at NRDC since he joined in 1988. Uh, and he has been an advisor to corporations. He's been called the godfather of greening. Uh, he has led a wide variety of collaborative efforts with businesses. And in recent years, this has been done with pro sports teams and groups through Major League Baseball the NBA, the USTA, the National Hockey League, and others. He's here today to share his insights about the challenges and benefits of greening pro sports. Please welcome Dr. Alan Hershkovitz of the National Resources Defense Council. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, it's really it's a pleasure to be here today. This is a, a great organization, a really historic organization. Uh, with a really noble and important mission, and uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk this morning uh, about the uh, state of the sports greening movement. Uh, right now, um, NRDC, uh, we started uh, greening professional sports teams and leagues back in 2004. Uh, NRDC uh, is the principal environmental advisor to Major League Baseball, to the National Basketball Association, to the National Hockey League, to the U.S. Tennis Association, to Major League Soccer, and we are one of the two principal environmental advisors to the NFL. Uh, we advise many teams, actually we advise more teams and leagues than any organization in the world. Uh, about seven years ago, eight years ago, uh, the sports movement, sports greening movement did not exist. Uh, today, by contrast, uh, the movement is one of the most influential collaborations in the environmental community. Uh, it holds the potential actually to become one of the most influential collaborations in the history of the environmental movement. As an industry with more than $400 billion in economic activity and hundreds of millions, indeed billions of fans and a global supply chain that includes some of the most visible and influential corporations on earth, uh, it goes without saying that shifting the operations and the procurement of the uh, sports industry towards ecologically preferable products can have a meaningful uh, market and cultural influence. Uh, the underlying motivation for this work uh, obviously are the many ecological pressures we face uh, which is driving more and more sports leagues, teams, and venues uh, to reduce their environmental impacts and educate fans throughout the world about environmental stewardship. So uh, what I'd like to do is uh, briefly summarize some of the on the ground accomplishments uh, of the sports greening movement and also uh, refer to some of the ecological pressures uh, that the industry is responding to. Uh, the fact is that the uh, professional sports and collegiate, we do actually, uh, we are the uh, advisors to the Council of Ivy League Presidents and we work with many colleges throughout the country. Uh, but the greening of sports, collegiate and professional, is really addressing urgent ecological issues that just really, as we all know, just, just can't be ignored any longer. Issues that are, are too important to be stymied by partisan political stalemates. Uh, the sports greening movement was, was really born out of a desire to leverage the economic and, and cultural influence of sports uh, on behalf of environmental stewardship. Uh, as you all know, greening is the process of reviewing your operations, reviewing your supply chain with an eye towards reducing environmental impacts. Uh, given the, the costs associated with, with running a professional league, with running a professional team, with putting on a Super Bowl or a World Series or a Stanley Cup uh, operating venues, the opportunity to, to, re, to operate, the opportunity to operate more, more efficiently can bring about meaningful benefits. Uh, in fact, um, uh, last year, NRDC, we produced a report called Game Changer, how the sports industry is saving the environment. If you go to nrdc.org slash sports um, dash game changer, or just go to nrdc.org slash sports, you could get that report. We're now putting out another report on collegiate sports. Uh, but it is, if, you, if you go and read those reports, um, you can see that the sports industry is really proving the business case for greening 
uh, teams and venues have saved literally millions of dollars over the past few years through energy efficiency measures, water conservation, recycling, waste reduction. In fact, some teams are, um, are saving uh, millions of dollars a year. Um, let me um, as, you know, remind you, there's, there's a reason why uh, some of the largest industries on Earth pay literally billions of dollars, collectively billions of dollars, to affiliate with professional sports. Um, these industries know that um, the sports industry, you know, the visibility of sports, offers an effective way to influence the culture of the marketplace. Let me remind you, uh, I, I do science. I've been on National Academy of Science committees and the EPA Science Advisory Board and many committees. But the fact is that 13% of Americans follow science. 61% of Americans follow sports. Um, so if you want to change the world, you, know, you don't emphasize how different you are from everybody else. You try to connect where people are. Um, all industries meet on a football field or a baseball field, a basketball court. The plastics industry, the food industry, the water industry, the textile industry, the auto industry, the energy industry. All industries are either suppliers or sponsors of professional sports. And sports, uh, when you get uh, Roger Goodell or David Stern, Gary Bettman, Bud Selig, Don Garber, you know, Senator Inhofe, uh, can attack the National Academy of Sciences reports on climate change with impunity, but he cannot attack Bud Selig, uh, and he cannot attack Roger Goodell with impunity. Um, so what we're seeing is, you know, sports is really a, a powerful engine for, for social change. So I'm going to uh, summarize some of the um, uh, accomplishments uh, of the sports industry, and uh, let's see if I could uh, work this thing properly. So uh, actually, uh, first thing I want to tell you is that all commissioners, Don Garber, Bud Selig, G uh, Gary Bettman, David Stern, Roger Goodell, all commissioners have come out and uh, made public commitments on behalf of uh, promoting environmental stewardship. They are all actively in encouraging their teams uh, and uh, league events to incorporate sustainable measures into their operations. Um, at some level or another, all sports leagues are engaged in uh, greening. At the team level, it's including fans, supply chains, local communities, and this movement is growing. Uh, the second point I want to make is that professional sports has really proven the business case uh, for sports for, for greening, uh, from, uh, uh, from cost savings and, and, and brand enhancement to developing new sponsorship opportunities and strengthening community ties. Uh, numerous teams, as I just mentioned, are, are saving millions of dollars um, and uh, seeing other tangible benefits and also reducing their branding liabilities. Recent events in Bangladesh, actually I just had a meeting yesterday with the Commissioner's Office of the National Hockey League uh, regarding textile procurement. Uh, these leagues and teams are, are, have huge uh, uh, branding exposure uh, and environmental liabilities uh, is something they want to make sure uh, that uh, are not part of their uh, operating uh, agenda. Uh, Fifteen uh, North American stadiums or arenas have achieved LEED certification uh, for green building design. Eighteen stadiums or arenas, professional stadiums or arenas, have uh, installed on-site solar arrays. Uh, and um, over two-thirds have already uh, developed or are developing recycling or composting program. Another point is that uh, more and more sponsors are joining with leagues and teams to promote ecologically preferable procurement. Uh, we're seeing more and more compostable, legitimately compostable plastics. Uh, Kim Jeffrey's earlier point today about bioplastics not being uh, suitable, being made from, from crops is correct. Uh, we should see, uh, and we're seeing more and more investments into waste-based bioplastics, um, not crop-based bioplastics, but composting is resulting in uh, teams like uh, the San Francisco Giants and the Seattle Mariners, just to name a couple, achieving uh, astounding diversion rates, recycling rates in excess of 80 and 90 percent. Uh, we've got three teams, um, uh, three leagues, uh, the N uh, NBA, um, Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League, which are now uh, have begun with our uh, collaboration 
developing environmental data measurement programs. Baseball, basketball, and hockey are now measuring energy use, water use, waste generation and recycling, and paper use consistently at all stadiums and arenas. Five years ago, this was not happening. And in fact, um, this October, uh, the National Hockey League, in collaboration with, we're, we're overseeing a project with the National Hockey League, we, they will be producing the first professional sports league sustainability report. It's coming out uh, this uh, October. Of the 126 professional sports teams uh, in the five major uh, North American leagues, 38 have shifted to renewable energy for at least some of their operations, uh, and 68, fully half, have implemented energy efficiency programs. All the large sports concessionaires, Aramark, Levy's, Delaware North, Centerplate, Sodexo, all of them, these organizations collectively feed tens of millions of people, have developed environmentally preferable menus. Not all of their menu is environmentally preferable, but all of them have environmentally preferable options. Uh, right now, we are working with these concessionaires actually to, uh, of course, we've switched uh, uh, their napkins uh, to uh, recycle content, uh, but we are now working with them to get more and more uh, poultry uh, that does not contain antibiotics. As you know, uh, as you may know, 80% of all the antibiotics consumed in the United States uh, are not consumed by people, they're consumed by livestock. Uh, and overwhelmingly, they are used prophylactic, prophylactically uh, to prevent livestock from getting sick, given the kind of conditions in which they're housed. Uh, what we're finding, and actually there was just an article, I think, yesterday in New York Times, uh, or today's New York Times, like, these days all blend into one uh, lately, um, about uh, trying to find uh, uh, remedies for these uh, superbug bacteria. We, uh, more people are, are suffering from uh, uh, problems related to uh, bacterial affections because of what they're consuming, uh, the amount of uh, bacteria that we're consuming from meats then are, 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 are suffering from, from HIV. Uh, it's, it's a very serious issue and we're just, we're getting mega dosed with, with, these, uh, with these antibiotics uh, that we're consuming in meats. I mean, some people literally, I mean, eating meat two or three times a day, uh, they're getting mega dosed with these antibiotics. So what they eat at sporting events uh, matters a lot. Uh, consider the, uh, the combined visibility of, of these jewel events, um, the Super Bowl, the World Series, the Stanley Cup, the Winter Classic, uh, the NBA playoffs and finals, the U.S. Open Tennis Championships, the baseball, basketball, hockey, Major League Soccer All-Star Games, and the World Cup. Just think about the combined visibility of those events. and now. Now consider the value of mobilizing all of those events to promote greening. Well, the fact is that that is happening. All of those events incorporate uh, environmental messaging and fan engagement. Right now, uh, well, for quite a while, we've been working on the All-Star Game. That's, we work on every All-Star Game, but this one is City Field. Uh, we're now working uh, diligently on the 2014 Super Bowl that's going to be held at MetLife Stadium, uh, working on the U.S. Open Tennis Championships, uh, great accomplishments at the U.S. Open Tennis Championships. We changed 2.4 million napkins from 100% tree-based to 100% recycled. Let me remind you that there is no one large overarching initiative that we could carry out that's going to solve the ecological problems we face, whether we're talking about global climate disruption or <laughs> ocean acidification or biodiversity loss or water scarcity. I don't even know if these are resolvable issues Certainly they're not resolvable in my lifetime. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be fighting to deal with them. Of course, we need to do that. And many social movements, whether it's civil rights or abolition of slavery or, or suffrage uh, 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 movement for voting rights for women, of course, people spent their lives fighting for those things and not seeing uh, them resolved in their lifetime. That may be the case with many of the ecological pressures that we're facing right now. What it underscores is that really small things lead to big changes. Uh, and uh, changing uh, the game day programs, the media guides, the concession napkins, the bathroom tissue, uh, ch getting energy efficiency audits, small initiatives on uh, water conservation, recycling, composting, all of these things are adding up. 
Uh, all the leagues, every league, now has uh, programs to educate their fans about environmental issues. Uh, in particular, of course, the most uh, visible interaction of a, a, a team or a league's environmental program in the case of uh, recycling and uh, reducing energy and water use. Um, and it's actually become an international movement, which is, which is very promising. Uh, the sports greening movement is, is, is operative in, in, in Europe, in Asia, stadiums in the UK, in Spain, in Germany, in Taiwan, have all incorporated in China. Uh, we, we're, we're working with arenas in China. They've all incorporated environmental fe features into their uh, design and operations. Um, this is uh, the supply chain of professional sports, which I referred to earlier. Um, it gives you an idea of, of, of the uh, industrial influence of, of professional sports. Uh, again, all industries uh, are affiliated with professional sports. Um, a few years ago, I co-founded an organization called the Green Sports Alliance. Uh, I was contacted by a representative from uh, Paul Allen, uh, co-founder of Microsoft. Uh, he owns the Seattle Seahawks, the Seattle Sounders, and the Portland Trailblazers, three different teams from three different leagues. He heard about our work. He invited us out to um, uh, Seattle to, to talk about greening his stadiums and uh, team operations. We brought in the Seattle Mariners, who we were already working with, so that was a fourth team, and the Vancouver Canucks, uh, uh, a fifth team, and we founded this small group that we thought was going to be a little Pacific Northwest Professional Sports Greening Alliance. Uh, this was just four years ago. Uh, five teams from five different leagues. Today, uh, the Green Sports Alliance includes 180 teams and venues from 16 different leagues. It's a very large uh, and fast-growing gro movement. Uh, the visibility, 400 million people are connected to the NBA by social media. That's 5% of the planet. Half the planet watched the London Olympics. Two-thirds of the planet watched the Beijing Olympics. Uh, the visibility, uh, we write, uh, uh, we do the environmental uh, tweets for the NBA, and for Major League Soccer, and for the National Hockey League, and for Major League Baseball. We, we, we help provide them with the little messages that they send out on Twitter regarding environmental um, uh, information, eco tips. Uh, we're sending out uh, Twitter messages that are going to six, seven, uh, eight million people at a pop. Um, let me... Uh, Very good, you are strategically located. Okay, so um, we produced, we do a lot of PS, we produce PSAs. By the way, NRDC, we, we, uh, we do not take any funds. Uh, we don't get paid by any league or team. We don't take any corporate money. Um, we provide uh, our service. We get funded by uh, you know, 1.3 mem million members, uh, benefactors, foundations. So we don't, we produce public service announcements. We pay for them. Um, it's very cost effective for us. We've produced two public, just, I mean, we've produced many public service announcements for the USTA with Billie Jean King, with Venus Williams, from Major League Baseball, you know, narrated by Robert Redford, one of our trustees who actually was the motivator behind encouraging us to, to work with sports. Uh, we produced two uh, uh, public service announcements, one for the NBA, uh, one for the NHL, uh, which ran, actually it'll be running during the Stanley Cup, ran on NBC, ABC, ESPN. In one week, it was viewed by uh, 45 million people. Uh, we spent $48,000 producing these two PSAs. Let me, let me show you. This is the one for the NBA. How does the NBA play green? With the help of the Natural Resources Defense Council. Together, we're sweating every part of the NBA experience to keep the environmental footprint small and the excitement big. From solar on the roof, to more recycling stations, to less wasteful packaging, to low flow water restrooms. It all adds up. Join the green team at nba.com slash green and nrgc.org slash sports. Interesting backstory of that commercial, uh, that PSA, uh, when the NBA, uh, you know, maybe, uh, sharing a little bit too much here, but I'm getting filmed doing it. Um, but um, when we first took it to, uh, when the NBA took it to ABC TV to air, uh, the lawyer said, uh, no, we won't air this. This is advocacy. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting because you see advertisements for clean coal and you see you know, all kinds of advertisements which people don't. Um, the good news is that um, the vice chairman of our board is the head of Disney Studios and um, so we asked him to just ask if the lawyers would just take another look at it. Um, and he did, and, and it ran. Um, 
and it ran on ESPN and TBS, uh, TBS and TNT. Uh, this is the one we did for the National Hockey League, which ran uh, also on those stations as well as NBC Universal. Hockey depends on ice, and you know, ice depends on water. That's why the NHL is teamed with the Natural Resources Defense Council. We're conserving the water we use and helping to safeguard its future. Because Earth's most valuable resource is pure, clean water. Preferably frozen. Join the team at NHL slash green and nrdc.org slash sports. Just got an email uh, this morning uh, from the commissioner's office. They're going to uh, try to get this played on NBC uh, during this next Stanley Cup. Uh, this is uh, this run is running. Uh, will be running um, at the All-Star Game at Major League Baseball. It'll be, it, it runs at the uh, second inning and the seventh inning of the World Series. It's happening right now, from the grassroots up. Major League Baseball is going green by making a commitment to more sustainable practices. Working together with the Natural Resources Defense Council and fans like you, the League is encouraging every team to increase recycling, cut energy use, conserve water, and use greener products. Please join us in making greener practices part of America's pastime, now and for seasons to come. So uh, that last one cost us thirty-five thousand. The other two together forty-eight thousand uh, dollars. So you know, for less than eighty thousand dollars, eighty-five thousand dollars, we're able to reach you know fifty, sixty million people uh, in a non-partisan, non-political way. That's really what's really critical about, about our collaboration with professional sports. Um, actually, the the movement was born at a meeting that we had at our trustees' uh, um, home up in Sundance. One of our trustees, Bob Redford. Uh, back in 2004, we, we met on how to reach non-traditional allies. Uh, at that time, uh, as many of you remember, uh, the White House, the previous administration, the Bush administration was literally changing EPA, the language, the text of EPA Science Advisory Board reports, trying to cast doubt on the climate science, trying to pretend that you know, what was fact was theory and controversial. And we had this meeting, we said, how do we break through this? How do we break through this noise? How do we really counter uh, the, the pressure of the White House trying to distort climate science. And, and Redford said, you know, if you want to meet Americans, you've got to go to a baseball game, you've got to go to a football game, a basketball game, let's, you know, let's start filling in with sports. I had worked uh, on the greening, the very first stadium greening project at Lincoln Financial Field with the Philadelphia Eagles football team. Uh, they actually asked me to come in to work on their carbon emissions, and I discovered that their toilet paper was coming from Eagle Habitat. Uh, so they were cutting down Eagle Habitat for the toilets at Eagle Stadium, which I thought was a branding liability. Um, and um, they thought it was a branding liability too, and they very quickly changed uh, what was going on there. You know, Greenpeace gets a hold of that one, they're in trouble. Um, so, you know, much to, you know, I mean, now the Eagles are, you know, without a doubt, you know, the leading sports venue uh, uh, in, in North America, certainly one of the leading in the world. And, and from that, um, our collaboration reached out to Bud Selig. Bud Selig is indisputably the most influential environmental advocate in the history of sports. Uh, he, he brought on Major League Baseball. He got a little bit of a pushback from some of the owners originally, thinking that NRC was, you know, a tool of the Democratic Party, but we're not. We're a nonpartisan organization. And, and David Stern uh, heard about the work. He's a member of NRDC. He's been one since 1988. He heard about our work with baseball. He invited us in to work with basketball. And, and nine of the NBA arenas are shared with the NHL. So Gary Bettman contacted us and asked us to work with the NHL. And, and Billie Jean King heard about our work and asked us, they named the stadium after her, the National Tennis Stadium, so uh, National Tennis Center. And she asked us to come in and work on the US Open. And, and that's how this, this movement sort of evolved. Um, and these are the issues that we're dealing with. These are really, you know, compelling ecological issues. You know, waste issues, you're, you're all familiar. We're generating between 15 or 16 billion tons of waste in this country every year. Oil and gas industry waste, mining waste, agricultural waste, food processing residues, municipal waste, nuclear waste, all kinds of wastes. Um, the United Nations is telling us there's 46,000 pieces of plastic per square mile in the ocean. 92% of all the plastics discarded in this country are not recovered for recycling. Only 12% of plastics packaging is recovered 
for recycling. So we have a, a pretty substantial ecological problem and professional sports, pardon the pun, is stepping up to the plate and, and they are in, 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 uh, implementing um, very meaningful uh, substantial recycling programs. Uh, since our work with Major League Baseball began just uh, six years ago, the recycling average for professional baseball teams has gone from less than 10% to almost 40%. Uh, but we do have standout teams like, uh, uh, as I said, the Giants and the, and the Mariners and the Cleveland Indians, uh, and just to name a few, that are achieving levels of 60, 70, and 80 percent uh, recycling rates. Um, in terms of uh, global warming, you, you know the data, you know the information, the 10 hottest years uh, uh, on record have occurred uh, since, you know, since 2000. Um, last year, the hottest year on record last July, the hottest month ever recorded, 53% um, a year ago right now, 53%, more than half of the country was uh, a federal disaster area because of droughts. We're seeing more desertification. Uh, water scarcity is going to rival sea level rise as a, as a consequence of, uh, of global climate disruption. Uh, we're seeing a lot of water conservation initiatives. We're working with the Staple. We work at the Staple Center. We replaced uh, 178 uh, urinals. Each one was consuming 44,000 gallons of water a year, 7 million gallons of water a year. We replaced them with waterless urinals. You know, they get their, uh, some of the, you know, Southwest United States gets its water from the Colorado River. The river's at the lowest levels it's been since records began being kept. It no longer reaches the Pacific Ocean. Lake Mead, the largest reservoir in the United States, which supplies all the water to Las Vegas, is half empty. It's projected to go entirely dry uh, by mid-century. Uh, it also supplies uh, the uh, water that powers Hoover Dam, which supplies a lot of electricity. I mean, we're facing some serious problems there. I mean, uh, the, the Diamondbacks and the Cleveland Indians, you know, they have their spring training facilities in Arizona. They're having a hard time. Uh, Cleveland Indians actually built a lake uh, to supply the water uh, for their spring training facility in Arizona, and they haven't been able to fill it up yet. Um, so all of these issues uh, uh, in terms of uh, wildlands and wildlife, you know, in terms of you know, uh, deforestation, you know, there's 32 million seconds in a year. Last year we cut down 38 million acres of tropical forest, more than an acre a second. A lot of that is going into paper making. So we're trying to get these teams and leagues to switch, and we are doing it successfully, to recycle content paper, um, paper from paper instead of paper from trees. You know, the greatest cause of biodiversity loss, and of course we're facing the sixth great mass extinction right now. The uh, largest cause of biodiversity loss is uh, conversion of uh, terrestrial forests. Uh, the paper industry is a big pressure there, so switching to recycled content matters a lot. Oceans, ocean acidification, uh, 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 marine debris, coastal, ero uh, coastal development, uh, bottom trawling. I mean, we, we, the, the pressures we're putting on the ocean are really just unprecedented mm -hmm. pressures on the ocean. 90% of all the large fish are gone. 40% of all the, the coral uh, in the Caribbean are, are, are gone because of um, uh, acidification uh, due to global warming, uh, carbon uh, uh, emissions into the atmosphere. These issues are all being addressed by, um, uh, by uh, professional sports, uh, and we're doing it in a way that's cutting operational costs, we're enhancing the sports brand, we're attracting new sponsors. So not only with existing sponsors are we able to actually broaden the message of existing sponsors, but we're able to attract new sponsors. So the, the range of financial support uh, to professional sports is increasing. Um, and um, just to give you some uh, little case studies here, the Orlando Magic, the Seattle Mariners, the Staples Center, the Cleveland Indians. We're talking about you know, meaningful, meaningful dollars being saved uh, by very uh, doable uh, uh, initiatives. Miami Heat, congratulations to them. <laughs> Last night they're in the finals. My son hates them, but it's the way it goes. He's a Spurs fan. Um, I mean, uh, just, just so many examples of what's going on. Switching to recycled products, uh, doing energy efficiency initiatives, uh, also, it's moving into collegiate uh, uh, realm, University of Colorado Boulder. I mean, there's, you go to a game, there's no garbage can. It's either recycling or composting. Uh, and they've worked with their plastic suppliers, as I said earlier, uh, to provide uh, uh, compostable cutlery. We are also the uh, principal environmental advisor to the Council of Ivy League Presidents. So we are greening uh, the Ivy League events. Um, this is just a, we recently uh, greened a, a woman's rowing championship. It's a lot of details, it's a tremendous amount of work, a lot of details. I mean, you know, we also oversee the greening of the Oscars and the Grammys because 
um, we need a cultural shift in the way people think about our relationship to the planet. Um, and what we know about cultural shifts, I mean, we need to change people's thinking about how we relate to the organism that gives us air to breathe. We need to change the way people think about how we relate to the organism that gives us water to drink, that keeps us alive. No business, no cultural activity is possible without clean air, a chemically stable atmosphere, without natural processing of waste, without clean water. Um, and what we know is that government does not lead cultural shifts. The civil rights movement uh, was not led by government. The Civil Rights Act was not passed because government led the way. There was a cultural shift in the way people thought about race relations and government responded. The Vietnam War did not end because government led the way on defunding that conflict. There was a cultural shift in the way people thought about that war and government was forced to act. The same is true with gender equality, the same is true with drunk driving, and we're seeing it happen right before our eyes today with regards to marriage equality. Government is not leading the way on environmental reform either. In fact, uh, the previous Congress uh, passed uh, 297 bills in the House of Representatives that rolled back environmental initiatives. Actually, Congress today, as I speak, is making it more difficult for the US EPA to enforce uh, environmental regulations and to address global climate issues and biodiversity loss and water scarcity and ocean acidification. So we need a cultural shift and sports can help us get to that because really ultimately what we're trying to do is preserve the functional integrity of the biosphere. And let me just leave you with this reminder, and I'm sorry I'm going over here, but uh, you know, uh, we have sent spacecraft to very far into the universe. Uh, looking for one thing, looking for life, looking for some other place where life exists. And what we have discovered is that so far, life exists nowhere in the entire universe that we know of, except in a very, very small, narrow 10 mile band, five miles up from the surface of this earth to five miles down to the deepest depths of this ocean. A small 10 mile band around this planet is the only place in the universe that we know that life exists. The rarest phenomenon in the universe, as far as we know, is life. Uh, and uh, we need to preserve it. And right now we are instigating the sixth great mass extinction. And unlike other extinctions that have occurred previously, this one is caused by another species, by us. And, this one, and, and that loss of biodiversity can be ended only by us. Um, and um, getting us to think differently about our relationship to the planet. Uh, when people go to a baseball game now and see composting, when they go to the US Open uh, and they see recycling bins and they see Billie Jean King on the, on the Jumbotron talking about organic food or uh, going to the uh, uh, World Series and seeing a, a message that this is the kind of thing business leaders can embrace, uh, environmental stewardship, this is going to help us get the cultural shift we need. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today. And thank you. Some questions? Okay. okay, in no particular order. How do businesses get involved in this greening sports movement? Um, well, uh, you could become a supplier or a sponsor to uh, a team uh, or a league, which has its costs, uh, financial costs. Um, you can uh, innovate your products and uh, present a, an ecologically preferable product as an option for a team or a league uh, to consider purchasing. Um, by the way, uh, there's minor league teams. Uh, Bud Selig said, you know, we're working on getting chemicals out of professional sports stadiums, uh, uh, grounds maintenance. He says he wants to get it out, he wants to get chemicals out of, all, uh, harmful chemicals, out of all little league games. Imagine that. Imagine uh, having every neighborhood ballpark in the country, uh, park maintenance crew uh, informed about safe chemicals uh, and golf courses. So uh, just think of the industries that support sports. Every, whatever industry you're in, there's an application of sports. You know, yesterday I met with the, with, with, with the commissioner's office at the NHL because we're talking about their textile supply chain. Uh, are you involved in plastics? Are you involved in energy? Are you involved in transportation? Are you involved in food? What do you, sports involves in, is involved in all of these. Um, your group focus on environmental issues, yet you mentioned the issue in Bangladesh which is related to, okay, I can't make that out. 
Are you involved in supply chain management regarding human rights? Okay, maybe that's what it means, human rights. Look, sustainability is about jobs, you know, sustainability is about uh, uh, you know, everything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, do we care about, uh, you know, uh, children and, and pregnant women assembling, disassembling electronics in, in, in Ghana and in China? Uh, uh, under uh, medieval conditions, dealing with 21st century toxics and medieval conditions, you bet we care about that. And in fact, all the leagues now, for example, uh, manage their electronics according to e-steward certification, third-party certification, to make sure that they're not being dumped abroad, uh, violating uh, people's health and safety. Yeah, human rights is, an, is I mean, environmental issue is a, uh, clean water is a human rights issue. Clean air is a human rights issue. Uh, safe working conditions is a human rights issue. Sustainability is about human rights. Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, what about golf? Um, golf is doing a tremendous amount. Actually, they have been doing a work on chemicals and water use for decades. The thing about golf, and I've met with them, uh, is uh, they don't really want to publicize their work that much. Uh, they just want to keep it quiet because um, they feel that uh, in terms of golf course development, you know, there's always challenges raised about water use and chemicals and stuff. But uh, golf is doing great things. I encourage them to come out more, more publicly about uh, what they're doing. Um, and other collaborations NRC is doing, as I said, we, we always see the Oscars and the Grammys. You know, we're trying to instigate a cultural shift. Of course, we do collaborations with, you know, with, with, with utilities, uh, with food companies, uh, with the concessionaires, with food suppliers, working on the antibiotics issues. Um, are you responsible for cold water only in the restrooms in the new Yankee Stadium? <laughs> uh, I grew up with uh, President Randy Levine and I grew up together. I'll, we're going to have lunch soon. I'm going to ask him about the cold water only. I, I don't drink the water in the cold water. Oh, oh, hands. Do you take a shower in the Yankee Stadium restroom? I mean, what's the difference if it's only cold water? Um, um, okay, how have fans reacted to the Green Sports Alliance efforts? Has there been any negative pushback? No, actually there has not. Um, and the, the Green Sports Alliance is an organization that we co-founded uh, with Paul Allen's uh, uh, organization. No, this has been spectacularly well received, um, uh, especially, by the way, in, in the college students. Okay, last question. Do you see uh, a move for these sporting organizations to fund or deliver community or education programs outside of the work with you? Um, it is incredible how much philanthropy professional sports is involved in. You would not believe it. Uh, some of the more visible ones like breast cancer or UNICEF or Habitat for Humanity or Environmental Stewardship, you may be aware of those, but uh, NBA Cares, uh, uh, Baseball for Tomorrow, uh, the N NHL Foundation, the, the diversity of work they're doing. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this work for 35 years and I've never uh, encountered uh, more uh, uh, community oriented. Remember, you know, all brands look for brand loyalty. Um, everybody wants repeat customers, but there's nothing like cultivating brand loyalty in sports. You know, some, that business, in the sports business, brand loyalty uh, assumes that your customers are gonna get into the fist fights with the customers of other businesses, Yankees versus Red Sox, or you know, uh, Chicago versus Detroit. I mean, brand loyalty in sports is, is passed down generation to generation to generation. I have a friend who's a Yankee fan, he, he moved up to Massachusetts, his two children are Red Sox fans, it's a crisis in his family. Um, that's, so, and, and sports, you know, in terms of brand protection and brand loyalty, very, very high on, on their priority list. Um, so anyhow, I, I encourage you to, in the Green Sports Alliance uh, Annual Summit is going to be in New York this August, 25th through 28th uh, at the Brooklyn Marriott. Uh, there will be a gala dinner. We are giving an award. Last year we gave it to Bud Selig. This year to the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles football team, Christina Lurie. Um, I encourage you to all come. For the person who asked a question about how to get involved uh, in business-wise in this movement, that's a good place to go. Uh, and again, uh, I just want to thank the Better Business Bureau uh, for everything you've done for so long. I mean, when I was a little boy growing up in Brooklyn, um, there were many times I wanted to call the Better Business Bureau. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, so are we at a crossroads? We'll be very interested to hear what you have to say. We've tried to provide you with sort of a 360 conversation, things to think about. You have evaluations in your packets. Please use them. 
I want to really thank again uh, Rhonda McLean, our chairman of the board, and for posting uh, through Time Inc. Thank you so much. And I want to thank uh, Ernst & Young, Popular Community Bank, the Stock Exchange Euronext, Goodwill Industries of Greater New York and New Jersey, uh, and all of our, our event uh, and media supporters, and all of you for being here, and my staff. Uh, again, Luana Lewis and her, her incredible team. Um, we thank you for being here today. Uh, like I said, please fill out the evaluations and stay tuned because uh, we will look forward to seeing you at the next BBB event. Thank you very much.